in the forecourts. The Republicans had set out to take rifles and pistols from soldiers of the Duke of Wellington's regiment. And when they resisted and shooting broke out, Private Henry Washington died immediately. In the next 36 hours or so, two other privates, Matthew Whitehead and Thomas Humphreys, succumbed to their wounds. Kevin Barry's nephew and biographer, Donald O'Donovan, visited the site of the ambush. We're standing more or less where Monk's Bakery, Church Street, Dublin, stood at the time. The road has been widened considerably. And what was the plan of action on the day? The plan was to take the arms from the men who manned a, a British lorry that came into Church Street to collect bread from Monk's Bakery for the men that were stationed on the Duke of Wellington's regiment in Collinstown. So we're here exactly on the site of the bakery? We are. They were, a British officer during the court martial measured the distance between the junction of Church Street and North King Street at 47 yards to exactly where the ambush was. The uh, unfortunate part was that the men gathered in the expectation of having a successful raid where they would hold up the British soldiers, take their guns off them, take their ammunition and go away again didn't work out like that. They had done that very successfully up the road in the King's Inns. Just be, just it's only about half a oh, mile up the road from here. Not even that, yeah. Mm. Uh, and they, they had a very successful, three months earlier they had taken all this stuff from the British Army and nobody was hurt. So they thought this is going to happen again. What happened was, unfortunately, a British soldier fired a shot in the air. He didn't fire as anybody specific as far as I know but the reply was of course the volunteers fired back and they fired to kill one was killed on the spot and two were so, so badly wounded that when they were brought to hospital they died the next day they were fairly young those men too well the British army had suffered as you know huge losses in the, in the war so all the men were young, 16, 17, 18 year olds, like Kevin was himself 18 years old, but the British Army had uh, nobody else. Generations of Kevin Barry's family on both sides came from a small area in North County Carlow, near Rathvilly. Kevin himself was actually born in the heart of Dublin in 1902 because some time previously his father, Tom Barry, had set up a successful milk and dairy business in the south of the city. But Tom died when Kevin was only six and the boy spent some years being educated in Rathvilly in Carlow and some years in Dublin in Belvedere College in particular. There's still a Kevin Barry on the old family holding, a son of Kevin's elder brother, Michael. This is the well, the old spring well. That's where the water supply came from for the house. And here's and the, the house. Ho the house is much as, is as it was in his day, in Kevin's day. He wasn't born here, though. No, he was born in Fleet Street in Dublin, number eight Fleet Street. And what's the connection with North his County Carlow? His father was born here, and his grandfather was born here, and his great grandfather was born here. So it was the family home up to I don't know when Thomas Barry went to Dublin that was his father he went I'd say in the 80s or 90s 1880 or 1890 his sister had gone to Dublin before him and had established a little dairy business in Fleet Street and that became their home why do you think did he come back down here from Dublin well I, I suppose I'd say it was something to do with, it. with of course his father was dead at that time too he was yeah uh, father be dead at that time. I suppose the mother, you see, his mother was from the area here. She was a Dowling before she married. And I suppose she had affinity with the area and she knew a lot of people in the area. We'll go in and have a look at the actual interior of the okay. house. Is the house much changed since Kevin's time? No. No, it hasn't changed very little. Of course, electricity and things in since then, but this area here in the kitchen now, the, the, the old fireplace, that was plastered over and it was a couple of years ago then we got the plaster removed and we didn't know that was under it at all it's an old fashioned hearth under it, it is yeah the old crane as well the old crane I mean it's the cup of tea I got from the smaller kettle there there was an open fireplace here and uh, 
the bellows, the heart was there and the bellows was there to blow the fire and all that. Would have been fairly happy here in the kitchen in the old days. Oh, you can picture it yourself there now. There were two hobs each side of the fireplace and you can imagine his grandfather and grandmother sitting in there to the side of the fire. And some of the neighbours in, I suppose, in those days. Would they have been a close family? Would your father and Kevin have been very close? Oh, I'd say they were, yeah. Yeah. So they were the only two brothers in the, in the family of seven. And so they'd have to be a bit close with five sisters. <laughs> He went to Belvedere and prospered there. I mean, he did very well in exams, and uh, but he was always an outgoing man, playing hurling and, and rugby. Uh, at the age of 15 then, when uh, he, that's 1917, he joined the volunteers. Why do you uh, think? The ethos of the family was always nationalist, and uh, he, there was nobody old enough to be out in 1916. But he joined in 17, and uh, I, I, I think perhaps his eldest sister, uh, Cathy, as she was known then, Cathy uh, Barry, was um, very, very anti-British in her feeling. And she, her, the first episode I could discover that she was involved in was walking out of a cinema with Kevin when uh, the national anthem, that is, God Save the King, was played. So you, you reckon he was influenced to a certain extent by his sister, his elder sister? He was. He was, for example, very... Uh, well, when he was arrested and, and uh, tried by court-martial, she was very much against a reprieve. She felt that he had been sentenced and that he should go through with it. Donal O'Donovan. Outside in Church Street, he continued the story of the sequel to the ambush. So they were able to find the three bullets and match one of them with Kevin's gun. And Kevin, in his own affidavit uh, to his sister, halfway through the court martial, he, he, they had a break, and out in the yard he told his sister, I lifted the flap of the lorry and I shot a man. And that, of course, invited fire back, and the, the general made a... The men, the IRA men, ran. Then somebody discovered that Kevin Barry was under the lorry because his gun had jammed. Uh, just as the, gun, the lorry was dry, pulling away, a woman uh, in a, sh a local shop pointed out that there was a man under the lorry. Her intention was to save his life because she thought they were going to drive over him. He was arrested by Sergeant Banks on the spot. He was brought to the North Dublin Union he was roughly treated, putting his arm around his back, bashing him around a bit, holding a gun to his head to try and get the information, uh, as much information as they could get about who had been with, who was his commander, what his unit was and so on. And he told them nothing. The men of the Duke of Wellington's regiment had been attacked in Church Street, coincidentally a few hundred yards from where the first Duke himself had been baptised in St. Mickens. But Kevin Barry had participated in earlier raids. There was the one at King's Inns, and two others in the North Carlow and Wicklow area. One, an attempt to burn down the old Ahavana barracks, by then a hunting lodge, was thwarted by its occupier, William Redmond, MP for Waterford. The raiders escaped on that occasion, but this time Kevin faced court-martial in Marlborough barracks beside the Phoenix Park. We're in the parade ground at McKee Barracks, which, as Malba Barracks, was the place where uh, Kevin Barry was court-martialed and sentenced to death. Eunan O'Halpin is Professor of Contemporary Irish History in Trinity College, Dublin. He's also a grandson of Kathleen's. That's Kevin Barry's eldest sister. Well, we're going into a room in the barracks. We're not quite sure which, in which room the court-martial took place, but uh, it was clearly in, in these precincts. The court-martial itself uh, wasn't a very lengthy and in some ways a very legal affair. What's most striking about it in terms of the record which we now have is that the, the prisoner was um, clearly quite adamant that he wasn't going to say anything except to decline to recognise the authority of the court or to make any comments. He read the newspaper. Disinterested in the proceedings, yeah. And I think that's one of the uh, particularly creditable aspects of, of, of Kevin Barry's life. Um, some people would have reservations if you read the accounts of the ambush, if you reflect on the people who died and how they died, 
it was a messy uh, and so much tragic affair, uh, not only for Kevin Barry, as it turned out, but for the three soldiers, one of them younger than him, uh, who was shot in, in, as I say, in, not exactly in, mortal, in a very uh, formal combat. But uh, I think Barry's uh, courage lies particularly in um, how he took his uh, imprisonment, uh, his maltreatment in, 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 in prison, and in some ways the, the almost cavalier way with which he addressed um, his uh, in, impending fate. Did the family keep many memoirs of uh, Kevin and what happened to him? Yeah, well, there's a lot of things here in the house, um, items as, such as his hair. There's a cutting of his hair there at one year, eight months old. Where have you kept them? They're down in the in the in the room here. Yeah. <coughs> this would have been kept by his mother, obviously. Oh yes. Oh yeah. Yeah. She was oh, there's a, a table full of material here. Yeah. yeah. There's the hair there. You can see the little box there. What's written on the on the label there? Kevin's hair at a year and eight oh, months. A year and eight months. September. What is it? September, nineteen hundred and three. And those little books there. That's a prayer book. There's one of them here signed the 1st of November 1920, the morning he was hanged. This little prayer book that he had in prison. The, 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 the last cigarette he smoked. Whether he smoked or not, no, I don't know. But that's what we're told. That was passed down to Car the museum in Carlow. You have his tie. This you is have a sort of a, a, green, a green tie. A lot of newspaper cuttings. Obviously the family kept oh, track a of... Hu a huge amount of newspapers here. You see at the back here. It's a photograph of the... Hurling team. Oh, hurling see, team. Very few people knew that there was hurling in Belvedere. It's 19, dated 1919. But uh, in the photograph, you have... There's a Jerry McAleer, Jim Murphy, who was also a friend, and Sean Davy, or Eugene Davy it is. Now, Eugene Davy would be the stockbrokers, or whatever you call it, in, in Dublin. It's unusual to see... The black and white of Belvedere with fellas holding hurleys in their yes, hands. Yeah, yeah, look, see the, the, the cut off point, and the, it's more like a hockey stick than a hurley, you know? Probably not much more than a year before he was hanged. Oh, I wouldn't think so, no. It probably was in the, in, in coming into the spring of 1919. Oh, would that be the right date? Uh, hold on now for a minute there. Because he would have been going to uni then in the autumn of 1919. Isn't that right? Because he failed his first year exams in medicine. So he was due to repeat them the day that he was caught in the ambush. And what about the song? Did you sing the song as a small boy? No. Oh, no I, I'm a voice like a crow. You heard crows out there today now when you come in. And, and uh, they're something like me. But no, would no, it no. have been sung in the family? It would. When I was young, it wasn't sung that often. But since the ballad period of the 60s came in, it's, it's sung fairly often now. The, the, the nicest version of that song, I think, is, is Paul Robeson. That's really very touching, the way he, he sings it, renders the, the, the whole thing, you know? In Mount Joy Day, one Monday morning, Upon the girl's tree, Kevin Barry gave his young life for the cause of liberty. But a lad of eighteen summers, yet no. Barry spent four weeks in prison before his court martial. By then, he was familiar with the sound of that triangle, summoning prisoners to their duties, a triangle made famous over 30 years later by Brendan Behan. When brought to Marlborough Barracks, he faced a charge that he had 
feloniously, willfully, and of his malice of forethought, kill and murder number 4603629, Private Matthew Whitehead. He ignored the President of the Court, Brigadier General Cranley Charlton Onslow, for the most part all that long day, October the 20th, 1920, a month exactly after the ambush. Among those who gave him moral support during the trial were his mother and his school pal from Belvedere, Jerry McAleer. He was found guilty, but it was only when he returned to Mount Joy that a Captain Barrett came to his cell and read him the sentence. To suffer death by being hanged. Now, when we go through this gate here, we are entering the main prison proper. Jim Petterbridge, senior chief officer in Mount Joy Prison. That gate you see down there at the very end, with the brick wall behind it, is the actual entrance to the execution chamber. The last walk would have been from that point there across to here. So can we pace it out just yes, to see? Of course. Yeah, yeah. This, this is the door here to the cell. Yes, that's correct. You're actually standing now at the entrance to the, to the condemned cell. On the morning of the execution, the governor, the two officers who spent the night with the condemned person, the chaplain, etc., would walk from this point here over to the entrance of the execution chamber and would pass through that door. Will we walk over there yes, and see how long yes. it takes? Yes. From the condemned cell yes. where we just set out. Mm -hmm. And we've arrived at now the entrance to the execution chamber. That's eight seconds. If yeah, about that. So we walk up very quickly now. It would all be a matter of seconds. Very, very quick. There were several attempts made to rescue him from uh, Mount Joy. Some of them were fairly serious and went wrong because uh, simple things like two of the Barry sisters were to go in and they had to wait until uh, a priest was uh, made a visit and, of course, by the time the priest was over, the guard was changed and they couldn't, could, the, the Barry sisters couldn't go in. And there was another one uh, to blast a hole in the wall of Mount Joy. And that was fairly obviously going to fall flat as well. It would have been fairly dangerous to attempt to rescue him anyway. It would have been because the auxiliary officers who were assigned to, to guarding him could have shot him first and asked questions afterwards. There would have been no questions to ask really because they would have done the work of the hangman. And it must have been very frustrating for the Republican authorities outside, say the likes of Michael Collins. Collins was extremely upset. The, there is a description of him in Vaughan's hotel that night in fairly distracted by the thought that anybody could be left there by himself to, to be hanged and he swore no more lonely scaffolds that's the phrase he used and it was not a, there were ten hanged altogether and that's the thing people forget too that he was Kevin was the first but he wasn't by any means the, the last there are nine other men whose remains are being removed from Mount Joy people like Frank Flood uh, Thomas Trainer, Bernard Ryan and others and they some of them got much dodgier legal treatment, I think, than Kevin Barry did. And that I don't think anyone disputes that Barry was involved in the engagement in which those soldiers died. Uh, some of the others, I think, were, in a sense, legally less fortunate. But I think they were also less fortunate, as indeed are, you could say, the soldiers who were killed and most of the people who died in the Irish Troubles in not being remembered, in not having any symbol of remembrance at all, really. Um, we don't know why most people in the Irish War of Independence died, except in the most general terms. Um, one of the documents that's come to light recently uh, in Britain <clears throat> is a note from one Dublin Castle official to another about Kevin Barry's last hours. And if you like, I'll just read you a couple of extracts from it. It's actually a, an internal memorandum from a person we now call a spin doctor, a propaganda person, Basil Clark, to an intelligence man, uh, Street. And it says, one of the guards who was with Kevin Barry during the last hours before his execution states that Barry's conversations was largely uh, on sporting subjects such as football and hurling. He had never been out of Ireland and had very strange ideas about England. He appeared to think of it as all one vast industrial area with no country villages or open spaces of countryside. He stated that he considered himself unlucky at being caught and remarked that his fellow accomplices who would have shared his fate were fortunate in escaping as they did. Towards the end, he lost all hope of reprieve. 
and remarked somewhat cynically that these were only known in the cinema world. He went to the drop with callous composure. I should say here that the phrase originally ran with composure and it was scored out and with callous composure was put instead. That's a, a, a terrific epitaph for any uh, enemy of a state, uh, for a state to, to not to put on, it, put on his gravestone, but to, but to provide for his memory. And also the fact that, as befits a, an engaging young man, he, uh, he appeared in some ways quite unconcerned and appeared to have quite interesting concerns like sport and so on, rather than politics or too much religion or whatever. Uh, he was an ordinary guy, in some ways a typical med medical student, perhaps slightly irresponsible about his studies, uh, perhaps drank a bit too much, uh, uh, chased girls, and in some ways was, was if you like, happy-go-lucky. I think it may be part of that quality which uh, endeared him to people. He became extremely popular because he was very good at gambling. He was very good at the horses and he could give the warders tips and did. And they all made a lot of money. And he was extremely popular. His rations were enormous. You know, he, he had uh, bottles of stout and, and fruit and all sorts of, and a ration of cigarettes and so on. Uh, he, at the same time, was very spiritual. And all sorts of, of uh, priests came to see him, and nuns, and uh, he welcomed the, the, the solace that they were able to give him, but I don't think he needed very much solace, because he was extremely outgoing and cheerful in his dealings with people. So you can see from his letters, he would always end the letter with something like, yours till hell freezes over. Uh, Jerry McAleer, who was his best friend, uh, came in to, to visit him on the 20, 28th of October. That would be three days before he was hanged. And Jerry asked him, who signed the confirmation? That's the confirmation of the sentence of death. And Kevin said, I'm blessed if I know. Was it McCready? That's the British general who was in charge of British troops here at the, at the time. And he, Kevin said, for all I know, or care, it might have been Charlie Chaplin. This room is the exact same as it was, with all the executions took place here. The uh, rope will be hanging from that chain there, so the con condemned person would come through here, straight out of the door, already bound, his hands would have been bound, his hands behind his back, the uh, cover would be put over his head, the, the rope tied around his neck, and basically it was that quick. Over here, the actual uh, hand which operates the, the doors, as long as this key is, is in, which is all intense purpose like a water key outside the house, the door cannot be moved. So if we remove the key, the safety key is removed, and if you watch the two snips, when I push the, the handle forward, two doors fall away, two trap doors. Now you'll notice, at, at each of the trap doors, there's a lump of rope and weights. That's to speed up the trap doors opening. The underneath, you'd have the uh, doctor, the chaplain. That's why this uh, small mobile stairs is there. That will be used by the doctor to uh, uh, pronounce the person dead, uh, the chaplain to give the last rites and also the trade staff who will be in attendance to take down the body. So the prisoner, the executed man, would be some distance above the ground and they'd have to access Correct. his it's body by climbing yes. that stairs. Yes, his uh, head will be about level, just there, level with the, with the trap door there. They, uh, they had a formula. It was done on, on uh, weights. They used sandbags, the, the weight and height of the person. Uh, the turbans, the length of the fall. Because uh, if, the, if the rope was too long, there was danger of decapitating the person. So they, they, they had to get that part of it right. Appeals for a reprieve were sent from many quarters, to the British authorities in Ireland and to the government under Lloyd George in London. The appeals were unsuccessful. And so, on the morning of the 1st of November 1920, a crowd estimated at 5,000 gathered on the North Circular Road outside Mountjoy Prison.
Then, shortly after 8 o'clock, this prison bell, which still hangs just inside the main gate of Mount Joy, started sounding, and a warder came out and pinned a typewritten notice on the wall. It read, The sentence of the law passed on Kevin Barry, found guilty of murder, was carried into execution at 8 a.m. this morning, by order. After the execution and after his death had been confirmed, um, the notice was put on the door of Mount Joint Jail confirming uh, his death. Uh, the, the bell was tolled and uh, Barry was interred, as was the, the practice within the prison walls. Um, he, he was joined, as we know, uh, by nine others uh, over the next eight or nine months. So the bodies have been there for the last 80 years. Um, in one corner at the front of the original Mountjoy prison. Nine of them are, are, will ultimately be buried in Glasnevin and the tenth is going uh, down to Limerick. What's this? The letter. This is the letter he wrote now. It's Sunday. Yeah. This is he Kevin's letter now the day before he was, he was executed. Yeah. I've just received your letter and thank you for it from my heart. I had all sorts of Letters, isn't it? Yeah. During the last few days, and I know the ones to be thankful to be thankful for. I had quite a busy day today. I had a visit from a most effusive young lady, whom I didn't know from Adam. She knew all about me, however. She wept, but she meant well. Then I had two sisters of charity. Then three more visits from the chaplain, followed by Father Albert. Then I interviewed two Bonds Corps sisters. I finished with the chaplain. The boys from the college were up outside the gate. They said the rosary, and they also sang the soldier's song, which did me more good than you can imagine. Everybody here is very decent. I have just finished my Halloween rations of apples and grapes, but I miss the nuts. However, there is no rose without a thorn. And I want you to thank all the people you know who have had masses said, etc. Of course, it is a mystery to tell you how grateful I am. Yeah. I believe the usual thing done in my case is to make a speech from the dock or something. But I couldn't be serious long enough to do it. Besides, anyone who ever knew me would never believe that I wrote it. Uh, now I'll shut up I wish you every success in love and business give my adieu to Des and your mother and say a little prayer when I cash in your pal Kevin That was a lad of 18 summers, a portrait of Kevin Barry, his life and times. Contributors were Donal O'Donovan, Eunan O'Halpine, Jim Petherbridge and Kevin Barry. The programme was presented and produced by Micheál Holmes. In Mount Joy J Day morning, I am